Everyone's always arguing about pineapple on pizza. Well, I'm going to give you pineapple on pizza that everyone can get behind. Pineapples on pizza. G'day folks, it's Michael from Doom of Darkness and welcome to Doomcast episode 4. I can't believe we've made it this far. All proceeds from this channel go to charity, so please like, comment and subscribe on the channel. All of those interactions help to promote it. The more it's promoted, the more money that we are able to generate for charity. So it's a win-win for everyone. We're currently running two giveaways on the channel. One is a Star Drake Ding. Uh, all subscribers of the channel are automatically entered into that. So if you're not subscribed, hit subscribe and you will be in the running to win that Star Trek. The winner of that's going to be announced on Doomcast episode five. So that's the next episode of Doomcast and should be out at the end of October. We've got a second giveaway running as well, which I'll talk about more um, as we get into the show. So, well, let's kick the tires, light the fires and crack on. So during this episode, we're going to first off do our community section like we always do, talk about the money we have donated to charity and also some um, uh, exceptional new content creators that are out and about I'd like to draw attention to. Uh, we're going to quickly run over what you can expect on the channel in October because it's going to be a big, big month and then go into one of the staples just as deadly. Uh, next up, we're going to talk a little bit about the Bendigo Bush Bash. Uh, we'll have a quick look at some of the uniqueness of the tournament pack, and then we're going to go through my list, and I'm going to give you a rundown of one of the games and so forth. Now, I don't actually have a full battle report uh, this month for you, but you'll have to forgive me. Uh, there's certainly going to be plenty of those coming in the near future. So first up, let's just talk a little bit about um, what we've managed to do on the charity side of things so far. So uh, since I rebranded the channel as such, you'll see that by the change of thumbnails and um, titles and uh, I abolished the Patreon and um, announced that I was going to donate all the proceeds to charity. That probably occurred about uh, two to two and a half months ago. And since that time, we've managed to raise $129. So how do we raise that? Well, we raise that simply by by you watching the videos, liking the videos, subscribing to the channel and leaving comments as well. Um, all of those actions help promote and grow the channel. And then because the uh, channel is monetized and has YouTube adverts on it, uh, essentially I get paid one cent or two cents, whatever it is, per view. Um, it's actually not one or two cents per view, but that's just an example. So the last two and a half months of people watching videos on this channel has generated $129. Um, that is paid from AdSense to me, and then I then donate it to charity on our behalf because realistically it is that team effort. Uh, I like making the videos. Um, you know, it's what I like to do and enjoy doing it. Um, you guys watch them and it's by you watching and sharing them that the money actually gets generated, right? So it's a community effort and simply by doing what we love to do, which is, you know, making Warhammer videos and watching them while we paint, um, we can hopefully do a little bit of good and give to the community by generating money for charity. Like it's just a win-win for everyone. Um, so please, like I said, like, comment and subscribe. That helps to boost the channel. That helps boost the income. And then it's not going into my pocket. It's going to be going to charity. So everyone here is um, pitching in. This month we donated to Dementia Australia, to their research foundation. Um, you can see that up there. Uh, so the $129 that we generated uh, has been sent to them and is going to go towards uh, research for dementia. So dementia obviously uh, a horrible affliction which um, most of us at some point in our life will know a relative or someone dear to us that will suffer this, um, uh, this brain disease. So, um, really quite terrible, but also really quite fantastic that we can uh, contribute and do a little bit more. So uh, I'm expecting to get a um, payment from YouTube at the current rate, um, probably every three months, we should get a payout like this and be able to donate um, more again. However, uh, if the channel continues to grow, um, then that will only increase. So there's two ways it can grow. The first thing is I need to make better content. I'm trying. And I'll be working on that. And um, number two, uh, audience participation. So those likes, those comments, and making sure you're subscribed um, all 
helps grow it because it's like a snowball effect um, starts off small we start rolling down the hill and um, you never know where we're going to end up so uh, awesome and fantastic and I can tell you what the gift of giving certainly feels really good uh, next up just shout outs and community events so I uh, just want to raise some awareness. We've got Sydney GT, which is coming up this month. I think that's in two weeks from now. Um, 100 player event, and that's run by uh, Anthony Magro, the AOS coach. So if you're not familiar with him, you've got rocks in your head, but um, check out his channel. Give him a subscription because he's doing good and fantastic things. And then next up, uh, the GT that I'm going to be attending is the Bendigo Bush Bash Bonanza, also known as the 4Bs. You can follow along with that tournament on Twitter under the quadruple B hashtag. And um, that's gonna be a 42 player event run by Measured Gaming down in Bendigo, Australia. So we've actually got, I think it's like 10 uh, South Australian guys traveling down for that event. Um, rocking up, it's gonna be a great, they've got a great venue and um, it's gonna be a hell of a lot of fun. So shout out to the Measured Gaming group. Um, if you are looking for more content to put into your ears um, and you're after something that's sort of long form, uh, something you can listen to while you paint or while you're at work, whatever it is, then I'd be recommending Mr. Mephisto right now with his rant car. So he's been bringing out a whole bunch of these. They're generally an hour to three hours long where he sits down and really just shoots the shit with a person. Um, over whatever is topical at the moment. And uh, this is the content that I like listening to the most. Um, just people talking about Warhammer, um, you know, having guesses, wild predictions, what's good, what's not. Um, that's what really floats my boat. So if you're looking for more content, check out Mr. Mephisto. Um, now, I was actually on his show talking about Auric Warclans just recently. I'll put a link to that video below. And that's where you can see the details of the second giveaway. Ding! So if you go over to um, that video and you leave a comment on that video, subscribe to Miss Mephisto, you'll be in the running for a, a box of the Fellwater Trogoths. Um, I'll be announcing those on Doomcast Episode 5 as well. So Doomcast ep Episode 5 is going to have two um, two big giveaways on it, which is um, awesome and fantastic. Um, and then... Last but not least, we have another battle reporter. That's right, Shadowhammer. Uh, he used to have a podcast, so this is Liam Burnett Blue. He is one half of the Sigma Down Under crew with AOS Coach. Um, he has, and he used to have a podcast called Shadowhammer. Now he has a Shadowhammer YouTube channel. Um, he's making some battle reports. So um, if you're looking for battle reports to watch, then um, certainly check him out. There is a link to that below as well. Oh boy. So, oh boy, we are on the cusp of an explosion, folks. So um, at the time I'm recording this, uh, this book is about to go on pre-order. So it's going to go on pre-order, what, tomorrow um, to be released the weekend that Bendigo Bush Bash is on. So the, the, the weekend that these books come out, I'm going to be playing in a Warhammer tournament and... Um, uh, <laughs> it's good and bad. It's bad because I want to be reading these books, but it's awesome because I get to play in a GT and get these books as well. So, um, first thing I'll say, if you want to hear me talk about the uh, information we know so far on Orc Walklands, go over to Mr. Mephisto's channel, check out his rantcast with me, um, click subscribe so you're automatically in the giveaway and uh, we have a two-hour discussion about all things orcs and the flying pineapples which is awesome and fantastic if you're looking for cities of sigma lead up content again mr mephisto is where you need to be because um, he had aos coach on um, talking about the cities of sigma now for me personally well let's just go to the next slide and we'll talk about it more there well oh boy folks we have got a um a crazy october ahead on the channel so first thing we're going to have is the auric walklands battle tome review so i'm going to be doing that hot off the press and um, hopefully if the ducks all fall in a row i'm going to be doing it with pete atkinson um also known as plastic crake on twitter so if you don't know him he is a um avid uh he's an iron jaws enthusiast that's for sure but he also plays a hell of a lot of green skins and savage orcs 
Um, in fact, at the Bendigo Bush Bash this weekend, it's, it's going to be his last run with his Cunning Ruck. So he's taken the Cunning Ruck to uh, multiple tournaments. He's taken Iron Jaws to multiple tournaments. Um, you've all seen the Flying, pineapple, flying Pineapples and uh, Pineapples here and my Iron Jaws on the battle reports here in the channel. So um, it's going to be excellent to get stuck into that. I'm not so experienced with the Bone Splitters as um, Pete is, so he's, I'm certainly going to be leaning on his experience um, when we look at that side of the book. I really can't wait for this battle tome. I think it's going to be like just truly awesome and fantastic and a hell of a lot of fun. Uh, then we've got the Cities of Sigma book that's coming out as well, and uh, I'm going to do a battle tome review on that as well. But um, you guys know I don't really play. Uh, one thing that I've always tried not to do is just do reviews on books that I have no fucking idea what I'm talking about, right? I always um, find that to be, it always shits me off when I start listening to someone who has never played an army, hardly ever played against the army, is maybe not even really that good at Warhammer, but they do a battle tone review and um, there's just so much to either miss or get wrong. Um, and so I've always been hesitant to do that, preferring rather to focus on armies that I actually play um, or that I have a real investment in. But um, uh, I'm going to do a review on the Cities of Sigma Battle Tome anyways. I'm going to probably do, like I haven't played that sort of army since Warhammer Fantasy, um, playing Dark Elves and Empire and Warhammer Fantasy, but um, uh, it does have a real interest of for me. Uh, a real big interest so um, I'm going to do a review on that battle term as well um, I'll probably do it a little bit different from normal uh, where there'll be some sections of that battle tome that I don't really focus on I'll more be focusing on the components and the units in that battle tome that um, are of the most interest to me so I'm going to be looking at that review from the perspective of here's a brand new book and um, let's try and see which armies I want to play in it and let's try and make some lists and let's build something. Let's actually build um, the list live that I'll then make and then start playing. So that will be the sort of the way I approach that. Then we're going to have the Bendigo Bush Bash tournament report that will come out. So I'll just be taking um, some photos during my games at, um, uh, at Bendigo Bush Bash. And... Um, you know, we'll put them together and do an overview of five games as well. Now, they're not really battle reports. They're just overviews because, you know, when you're playing um, tournaments, it's hard to always remember to take all the sequential um, photos that you need. Um, but it's going to be a uh, good video anyway. I'm pretty sure I'm going to get my poo pushed in, but it's going to be fun. And then in the meantime, while we're um, making the battle tone reports and so forth, I'm still going to be playing Warhammer. And have no doubt, it's more than likely I'm going to be playing with both my Iron Jaws and my Gut Busters as well. Probably those two. So um, you can certainly expect new Iron Jaws battle reports on the channel so shortly. And by the time we get all this done, it's going to be the end of October and it's time for Ossiarch Bone Reapers. So um, like it's just going to be an insane month of content with both those books, Battle Tome Reviews, Battle Reports, Tournament Reports and um, it might even be three battle tome reviews in one month so um, that's what we have got coming up now before we go into just as deadly i just want to circle around a little bit back to cities of sigma and um, talk a little bit about what we've seen previews so far so there there are a range of different things that make me really excited about this book um number one well, actually, let's just talk about a handful of models first, because that's important. So um, I don't think I've spoken about it on the previous episodes of Doomcast, but in the lead up to this book, essentially what happened is that they announced that City of the Signal was going to come out and it was going to combine all of these um, old order factions. They said as a part of the community article that a handful of models were going to be made or be discontinued. And um, everyone thought, oh, that's cool, you know, just a, a, a few kits. And then I think it was like 14 or 15 kits that they discontinued, um, including uh, some people's almost whole armies. Well, um, uh, I think fewer people's whole armies than uh, perhaps some people might have led on, but certainly um, quite a wide range of um, models that people already own. And hopefully not many, had, many people had run out and then purchased those models. But there were some real surprises in there, like Gladeguard, for example, 
being made um, obsolete and uh, or discontinued and um, you would have thought they would be one of the easiest kits to work into Cities of Sigma. So um, probably a little bit disappointing how that happened, especially for people that were heavily invested in those models, either because they loved them, they had a um, emotional sentimental attachment to them, or because they had just bought a whole heap and there was a financial loss as such there. Um, certainly I think that um, the order that um, Gamers Workshop released their news and how they made those kits discontinued um, could have been much better um, no, no matter how they did it people would have been upset by it but they could have probably softened the blow a little bit more and the way I would have done it is I would have put out a um, release that said um, dear value customers um, at Games Workshop we're very much committed to updating the um, uh, legacy armies and legacy war scrolls and um, moving Age of Sigma to a point where all armies are updated and compatible with the current AOS 2.0 rules. Unfortunately, due to the ever-growing size of the Games Workshop um, collection or stock, um, we are unable to um, bring every kit forward into this new era and as such, the following kits are going to be discontinued. XYZ blah 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 blah. So the, the thing is, is you say that first and then people that right then and there aren't buying these kits with the expectation that they'll be able to use them in the future. As soon as people get that news, they say, that's really sad. They know they're not going to be included in the future. But what I actually find is that when things go to last chance to buy, a lot of people rush out and buy them, but they buy them because they want to have the kit before it goes extinct, right? They want to use it for a different game system. They want to buy it to just have for sentimental purposes, or they just want to buy it to add to the collection. They love the models. And um, when people are buying models for that reason, um, they're completely happy that it's being discontinued. They've accepted it and they're buying it knowing that. As opposed to if you um, say, we're going to bring out a uh, Cities of Sigma, which is a combined faction which combines all the factions, then people can run out and buy models with the expectation, thinking they're going to be able to play them or get their hopes up that they're going to be able to use all these models. And then afterwards you tell them, no, we're discontinuing them. Well, that's just very, very negative. So what you sh what could have, would have been a better option, you um, make, it, make an article saying, we're unable to move all the uh, products forward. We're going to discontinue these. That gives people the chance to run out and buy them before they're gone. And then once that process has happened uh, or begun, then you announce Cities, Cities of Sigma um, that it's coming. And then no, no one has the expectation that those models are going to be including, included. And so no one is disappointed um, as like the almost first reaction from that. So I just wanted to talk about that sequencing a little bit. Um, certainly in the future, if you flip that around, um, and I think you can be, I know Games Workshop actually likes to hold all of their new releases very close to their chest, um, but I think you can be a little bit more transparent with this process and it won't impact the wow factor in any way at all. In fact, it'll probably have the opposite effect. Simple releases to say we're no longer able to continue stocking these units. They're going to last chance to, to buy is completely fine release and I think the community would be very appreciative of that sort of communication. So um, that's enough about that. Next thing, let's go and take a look at this picture that we have up in front of us. So we've seen various different um, community articles and um, let's just go into the free peoples a little bit. I wasn't intending on doing this section, but um, we're going to do it anyways because it's a lot of fun. So the first thing I'm going to say is that I hate Firestorm. Um, <laughs> Firestorm, for a lot of you may remember, is what I think one of the like absolutely fantastic idea implemented into Warhammer very poorly. Uh, it's always been that sort of example, I believe, where the um, designers and the, the writers behind the scenes at Games Workshop uh, creating a really cool idea and a cool narrative. They create the product and then they have this implementation problem where they've made this cool thing, this campaign called Firestorm, and then they get to the point they say, well, okay, now we've got it. 
we've got the story, we're defining the law, we've got some cool rules for these factions. How do we actually put it in the game now? And they're very uncertain, um, they're unsure about the best way to do it, or they have an idea how to, but it's not as well thought out as they could have. So these are the reasons why I was always very negative about Firestorm. Not because um, what is in Firestorm is not good, but rather because when it was released to the market, it was um, no one really knew what was what, no one knew how it worked. There were some um, backtracking on certain things, like yes, you have to paint all your models in the the colors of the you know of the allegiance in order to get the rules, and then flipping on that sort of one or two weeks later, and then. Um, match play but not match play not quite understanding how it fits in as far as battalions go is this just for free etc etc and um, then since Firestorm went out of like print like you couldn't get it really anymore um, it's still something that's carried on in the tournament scene where people have allowed it and now you have like a fr an, an allegiance in a, in a sense that you can't buy anymore, which I just I just don't like how that sort of all played out. So I've never had anything against the, um, the fire, Firestorm itself, it's more its implementation. And mainly because I'm super, super keen, and the thing I want more of is the development of the narrative in um, Age of Sigma. Not because I'm a massive narrative guy, but I just, I just understand and respect how important it is to the game overall and also how we all sort of hobby um so i'm not about all about the narrative gaming or anything like that but i just like it like i really like the law i like the fundamentals the foundations that it puts down for getting me invested into each army and then um, getting me hooked on the idea of an army, and then I paint, I build it, I paint it, um, I play it, I get the emotional attachment, and I'm hook, line, and sinker, right? The law, the the models, and the gaming. All three sides, I think, are, are critical to this hobby. So um, Firestorm is excellent for um, introducing the different cities and um, giving them all some different flavor, the Phoenicium and so forth. Um, so there's no criticism from me in that regard um so anyways i just needed to to put that in so but because firestorm i guess the implement implementation of it was um i never looked at it i never really did and um i have been playing chaos and destruction um almost since well you know a bit of order here and there whatever and a bit of death here and there too but for the most part part i've been playing chaos and destruction since the release of age of sigma and uh, my focus has very much been on those armies and also their lore and their narrative as well and so the stories behind um firestorm i haven't really delved into um and also because to an extent i didn't know how legitimate it was like so i read the realm gate wars right and that gives me um like whatever you do or don't think of the realm gate was I actually thought it was great not because of the level of writing or anything like that but simply because i got introduced to a bunch of characters which i could have some emotional investment in like gardas and uh, vandas hammerham and gorgas Carl and things like that right so um it gives me some physical description of the different realms and some things to expect there although there are large components of that i didn't like because it was too grandiose and too big um and so but it still did give me a footing in the realms and it also gave me a progression of this of the storyline like with a timeline attached to it as well um knowing that this is the first point and then this is the end point right um and that's sort of important i think in in getting attached to the age of sigma world but what it did do as well is it gave me the idea in my head that every these realms are so big that any one small event can never really be of any significant consequence like apart from something like the death of a god or whatever it is but you know when you're describing dragons sleeping in the sky that are as far as the horizon from one point to another and are so big that you can't see 
the beginning and the end of the dragon. When you're looking at, um, you're describing the hordes of Gorgas Cull being the, uh, Gorgas Cull being, uh, like these immense, like, enormous hordes that stretch the horizon from hill to hill and, you know, this sort of stuff. And then you then later go to, to describe that his whole empire, being the mightiest lord of corn, is only just this one peninsula, the brim, Brimstone Peninsula. You start to think, well, okay, no matter what happens here, um, it really doesn't have any impact on these realms because of the sheer scale of them. And so I have that impression in my head from the Realm Gate Wars, and then we go into Firestorm and we start talking about some individual cities. And you sort of go, yeah, okay, that's cool. There are some cities now. Um, that's more than we had before. But really, in the scheme of things, they're kind of irrelevant, right? Because um, there are no real armies attached to them. Uh, we've only got this firestorm stuff, which doesn't really like fit that well. And um, also everything's just so big that these cities can never really be um, that significant. So that's where um, my head was at as far as the law and the cities and the free peoples and that sort of thing. And um, over time, that's gradually changing and these cities are becoming critically important as the storyline is starting to focus down, right? So it's starting to um, leave the giant, you know, realms which have no end and really start to focus on small areas and specific areas within those endless realms, um, including these cities. And the more you focus down the tighter view, the more important the um, the more you know about a smaller area, the more important and the more significant the actions in the law have on those small areas, and so it has more meaning. This is one of the reasons why the old world law is is constantly, you know, said that it's um it's better. And I'll make a different video about that. But a lot of people always say the old world law is better than the Age of Sigma law. But if you read the actual writing and um, the actual law in both the books it's pretty much on par like there's not that much more skilled writing or better level of writing in the old world than there is in age of sigma for the most part it's the same bloody authors but um the old world was far more defined and it was also restricted um, and so things had more significance it's the same as like all of the ogre kingdoms were pretty much restricted to the mountains of Morn or the surrounding area. Now that was a big area, but it was really quite small. If there was an invasion of the mountain of, mountains of Morn, this had a real impact for the ogre race. However, in Age of Sigma, if you have ogres that are inhabiting, say, an entire small continent in one realm, and they were completely wiped out, you would just think, oh, who cares, because there's ogres everywhere else in all the other realms as well. Right, so that is the real difference. When your your faction is restricted to such a small area, that is their home area. Well, um, things matter, and you get um, you get attached to it. Anyways, wow, what a um, what a I digress. Let's move on. So, Cities of Sigma is coming out, and so for all of these law reasons that I just explained, Cities of Sigma is really, really super important. So, not only is it important from a law um, perspective because it's going to give us that investment into these cities um, but it is also critically important in um, updating Age of Sigma and bringing the legacy armies into a new world getting them to a point where they're going to be playable moving forward getting to a point where people can start to make their own armies out of them and identifying with them so instead of looking at Phoenix Guard or looking at um, uh, these armies and looking at them and just seeing the remnants of high elves i believe now that with some time everyone is going to start looking at them yeah in a year or two i don't think people are going to be looking at these armies and seeing uh, high elves they're going to look at these armies and see phoenician 
right? Uh, that's a really critical step, I believe, in Age of Sigma. A lot of uh, players can come back and use their old models with new rules, new power levels, and um, that's just encouraging for everyone. And given the size of these collections that are out there, that's a lot of people out there that are now able to engage and compete. It's like all these people are ogre players, right? They're all gut busters players, but instead of just being gut buster players, it's actually like six factions worth of gut buster players finally getting updating rules and finally being yes, we can play with our toys. Um, a little bit of salt in there because they lost some of them with the um, the Great Order Extinction, um, but uh, I've already spoken about that. So as much as the Orc Walklands book is actually um, like more my jam, right? Because I'm going to be playing with my Iron Jaws. It's for my army. Um, but like I was saying before, this is the third, I think it's the third, like, um, version of Iron Jaws I'll be able to play with. So it's just like, oh yeah, cool, new rules. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be fun. It's going to be nice to have them. But um, it doesn't really do that much for me in Iron Jaws in the lore of the world, um, Age of Sigma, it just updates them a bit, one small faction. This book though, does it for 10 or 20. I just, uh, this, this Citizen Sigma book is, um, I think has huge significance for Age of Sigma overall. So what have we been looking at while I've been talking all this shit this whole time? Well, this is a list of the battle line options for Age of Sigma. So I should uh, say that all of these units can be battle line in Cities of Sigma. So can be meaning if you are from the right um, city, you have the right general, these are all the battle line if options. And um, let's just go through them and have a look at them because there are some things here which um, I'm not, and this is the other thing as well, the depth of this book um, and the depth of the people that it's going to appeal to is really quite huge. So. Let's just go through a process of elimination. So all of the bleak swords, the dark shards, the dread spears, I love those models. I think they're awesome. The, um, um, and this is legit legitimately, this is how I start building most of my armies, right? It's not based off rules. It's not based on anything. It's based off what I think looks cool. And that's what I want to start to play with. So bleak swords, um, I love tick dread spears. I love, um, dark shards. I, I kind of like because they're the relative of the other two guys, but um, they look a bit derpy and uh, I don't really like them that much. So we'll cross them out. Um, Eternal Guard. Yes, they are cool, cool models from the Wanderers. Um, what are these? Crossbowmen or Musketeers? Nope. And Halberdiers? Nope. So anything with a cod piece to feathered hats and so forth, I'm really not that keen on. Uh, at one time in my life, I like playing them. They're actually cool when they're ranked up and they... They're, they're, cool, they're a cool army on the table, but for me, it has zero interest in building an army which has any components of that sort of garbage. I want humans in um, Age of Sigma, like I want order humans in Age of Sigma. I really want them. I don't want them to be free peoples or free cities though. So we're crossing these empire jerks off. They are absolutely removed from the possible options of any army that I'm going to build in this um in this new book so if you guys like them cool like i'm happy for them and i actually like them like when i play against matt the wild form weiss and his empire you look at the army across the table and you're like sweet that's a sweet army but it's just not for me next up we've got these uh what is it iron breakers and long beards i think and i have to say uh for dwarves um like the dwarven models hammers and and things like that are awesome they look really really awesome it's a really sweet army but um so i'll give these guys a tick for looking cool it's a little bit you know what i want in age of sigma i want um i want power dwarves right not carriage and flying steampunk punk dwarves i want the sort of dwarves that rock up out the um the front of the castle in lord of the rings out in the hobbit to fight the elves and um you know the orcs show up and they're just like we're not fucking around let's go shield wall spears out the front let's stab some orcs they're the sorts of dwarves i want no nonsense hammer to the face but um despite these guys looking cool and me loving the idea of them the simple truth is doom doesn't do dwarf 
So we are crossing these dwarfs off the list. Next up, we have uh, Scourge Privateers and um, the Reavers, they're pirates, they're Dark Elves. I used to play these Dark Elves back in Warhammer Fantasy. I used to use them as my bunkers in my um, Dark Elven army. They're really cool models, but um, unfortunately, Luke Stone, that's right, Luke Stone, so they are crossed off. <laughs> I love Luke Stone, he's awesome, but um, they're his deal, so we are not touching them, not with your dick. Next up, we've got Dark Riders and double tick, triple tick for these guys, because I've been dying for a like a use for these guys. Um, yeah, the Doomfire Warlocks in the Dark Elves, and I've just been like going, duh, like why, where is the use for their... Um, the jewel kit from that kit and um, for me dark elves I love them uh, a fast cav type unit in dark elves yes 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 uh, they are making it into my list next up we've got the uh, demi griff knights and yes I actually like these models I think demi griff knights are excellent I love knights I like full plated humans uh, anything that's medieval and fantasy is a tick um, so I'm going to give these guys a tick uh, I don't think I'm going to be able to cross blend them with the sort of dark elf sort of troops to make it look um, aesthetically pleasing. Uh, so that could be a side thing, but um, we're going to give them a half a cross. Okay, I like them. I like everything about them. Um, I could do them in an army, but with the army I'm moving towards, I don't think they're on the list. Chariot, um, tick, yes, um, no problems like chariot yes drake spawn knights over here uh cold one cavalry previously known they're going to get about four or five ticks from me because i actually love these models um i love the dark hills riding them um i used to run a bus of these in warhammer fantasy with my lord in there up the front and um well you know hit first always strikes first uh, that lance for the extra strength and um he could do some significant damage but um yes I want heavy, heavy cavalry dark elves in my army absolutely all day long. Executioners, I love these models. I want them in my army. Flagellants, you can go and um, suck a big dick. Uh, I don't mind that, um, like they're cool, whatever. Um, but that's not my, not my kettle of fish. Um, great swords. Great swords are like demigrifts for me. Um, I absolutely love them. I think they're a cool model, like heavy infantry, right? Big dual swords. Um, yes, that is all cool. Um, and I would absolutely be happy using them in an army with demigriffs, but I don't think we're going to put them into my Dark Elf army. So let's just cross both the demigriffs and the um, the great swords out, despite me really liking them. Hand gunners, mounted gunners, cross them out. Not interested. More dudes, pistoliers on horses, not interested. I think that's hammerers, dwarves, um, cool models, excellent, but we don't. Doom doesn't do dwarves. Um, Thunderers, again, Doom doesn't do dwarves, but excellent. Like, there's the dispossessed models, I think, are just sweet as, and in an army, they're, they're great as well. Phoenix Guard, um, yes, okay you're going to get one and a half ticks from me because the elven like you take all of these elven units so far the dark the bleak swords the eternity guard the executioners the cold ones the phoenix guard um the dark riders if you even though they have a different aesthetic if you get a whole army of those from the different aesthetic but you paint them the same color because they all have armor they all have cloaks they'll have the same sort of dimensions, it will all blend, like it will all blend sweet. So um, Phoenix Guard, um, absolutely, they could make it into my list. The next Chariot, Dark Elf Chariot, yes. Um, Shadow Riders, Shadow Warriors, sorry, absolutely all day long. Like we've seen a leak of their ability where they can pop up on the table anywhere, nine away. Um, they are restricted by turn, like you can't do it after turn can't do it in turn four or five so turn one two and three they have to appear but the ability to have a small unit of 10 models just appear anywhere on the board nine away from enemy is super super strong so i will be trying to include one or two um like ninja elves ninja shadow elves fuck yeah um paint them up the same 
that they're, they're just going to blend it's going to work the um sisters of a thorn on the stags um and then the wild riders the jewel kit like i actually like them uh model wise but you know what i don't want them in i just don't get out of here uh, i don't know why um i just don't think i want elves on stags in my army uh, that's the main problem. These um, sisters of uh, the war, whatever they're called, um, with the magical bows. Yes, 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 yes. Twenty thousand times of those girls. They're excellent. Like I love those models. Um, I want to have shooting elves in my army, right? Because I really want my elven army. Yeah, you see where this is going. I really want my elven army to be like combined arms, right? I don't want to build like a massive skew thing. I want some ninja shadow warriors i want a shooting unit i want some elite fighting units um and then i want some other units to be chaff or uh, objective securers or whatever it is as well so i certainly want them the army wildwood rangers all day long um yes 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 steam tanks no not interested in steam tanks unfortunately some people are like oh yeah steam tanks can't wait to run an army of them um not for me for you cool but not for me charybdis nah not really um just no um although it's cool like yes and i hope it's really strong and i hope people are happy playing with them because they were shit in fantasy and uh they've been shit in age of sigma up till now as well but um not for me the hydra yeah kind of like um okay the hydra in the army yes as battle line it's a cool option but um i just want to have the ability to have like hydra and the um dark elf lords and sorceresses on dragons and then i'm pretty sweet the other thing that i do love though is the griffin the two-headed griffin with the battle mage on the back that's all time one of my favorite models so um we'll probably end up building one army which is largely a, a combination of elves so this is what i want folks you can see already just from what i've ticked and crossed the sort of free people's army the city of sigma army i want it's dark elves it's wanderers and it is some high elves merged into some sort of city so if i can have a city with a law and then a set of usable rules or a battalion or anything that lets me make any combination of what i've got ticked here um that's where we're going down that's the path we're going so i think that for just about anyone that plays age of sigma you could go through this list with a similar exercise that i've done just looked at these models and said knowing that they all feel a different uh, like variety of ranges and you could say tick cross tick cross tick cross tick cross and you've made your own free cities army right which you like and so no matter what your flavor, no matter what your tastes are, you know, I think you could get 10 people sit down, go through this process and you probably end up with like eight different armies, all which would be usable within the book. This is what I'm most excited for um, uh, Cities of Sigma 4. So I wasn't planning on doing this, but I thought it's just too good to not talk about. And um, anyways, let's get on with the real awesomeness, which is Ogres in Just As Deadly. All right, folks, so let's go with Just As Deadly, my favorite segment of the show. This is where we talk about everything Gutbusters, everything Ogres, and uh, everything that is awesome. So, uh, well, the first thing we need to cover off on is shortly after the last episode of Doomcast, uh, Games Workshop released the Tales of Forbidden Power Blood Tender, and this got me so worried. So essentially what this is is a short story that explains how Stormcast, uh, an army of Stormcast Eternals that are um, moving to intercept the Iron Jaws, which are on a war at the moment, come across a band of ogres, which have seemingly slaughtered a caravan, right? And are in the process of cooking them, got, cooking the um, the uh, the people that were with the caravan, eating them and uh, and looting everything. Um, the Stormcast then move to engage the ogres and a battle ensues. And it turns out that these ogres are particularly and specially mentioned Firebelly and um and man eaters as well so um this was really cool because wow we all thought well i certainly thought that firebellies and man eaters they're in the mercenary pack right there is the actual rule and the groups for mercenaries for man eaters and firebellies 
and I always thought that was a sign of things to be discontinued because we've certainly seen in some cases that's true. So I thought, okay, well, this is a way that Games Workshop is going to allow everyone, they're going to discontinue man eaters and fire bellies and then allow everyone to still use them in mercenaries, though, right? So they don't have to support them, but if you've got these old models, you can still play with them as mercenaries if you like. And um, um, and then I thought, well, I saw this 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 story. And what ends up happening is that the um, Stormcast and the Ogres stop fighting. It turns out that a bunch of Orcs actually attacked the caravan. The Ogres killed the Orcs and then decide just to eat everyone, right? And it sort of goes through and explains how here we have a unit of Stormcast Eternals, which are Order, and they end up teaming up with these Ogres and allying with them as mercenaries against the Iron Jaws. So the story literally explains to you narratively how the Firebelly and the Maneaters, which are mercenaries in the GHB, could work with the other armies, right? It's a full justification for that system. That was what was most apparent to me. And I pooped myself because I thought, oh shit, here we go. Games Workshop has just re released a story that is encouraging after the release of more tribes, that is talking about fire bellies and man eaters in ogres. And this is going to be a sign to everyone that these units aren't going to be made um, last chance. They're going to be um, included in the army. Everyone's going to get excited, run out and buy them, and then they're going to go last chance to buy it. And everyone's going to be disappointed because they're going to say, well, you brought out more tribes and then you brought out a story with these when everyone was concerned. So, you know, it was a pretty clear sign. So I thought, oh no, Games Workshop have really stuffed up here. They've released a fun story about the mercenaries without putting much thought into, you know, what the more tribes community is thinking at the moment. But supposedly I'm wrong, right? So in the Warhammer um, Age of Sigmar page, you can see here, um, good old Luke Stone, Scourge Privateers says, um, so this is a sign that these mercenaries won't be discontinued in a couple of the weeks like so many from Order were. And Warhammer Age of Sigma replied to say, they're not going anywhere, Luke. Pardon me. Someone else comes in, Damien Cooper says, no new models, pretty lame, blah, 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 whatever. Um, but then Philip Jenkins and myself says, Warhammer Age of Sigma, we're going to hold you to that. The fact that these models aren't going anywhere. And then Hayden Walker comes in with a deadly as ever comment because um, you can't bring up gut busters without being deadly as ever. So this is quite important. Here we have the story, which is talking about the mercenaries. There's a fear that they're going to be discontinued. Um, it's directly addressed on the community page by Luke Stone. He says, is, is this a sign that these aren't going to get discontinued? Um, and they respond and say, they're not going anywhere. So... I guess this is as much evidence as we could ask for that man eaters and fire bellies aren't going anywhere but are being included in the book. But you know what? <clears throat> Despite this, I'm still not convinced. Like, I'm just saying right now. Despite them saying that these models aren't going anywhere, I'm still not convinced. They are all temporarily out of stock on the um, GW webpage at the moment and um, it looks like. Yeah, that's the sort of thing that happens when they're getting reboxed, which is cool and a positive sign. But um, you know me, I'm still just in my head, I'm still thinking they're going to get discontinued and I'm going to be super happy when they're not, as opposed to expect they're going to be included and then just be absolutely gutted when they're not. It's just the way that I found is best to go through um, Warhammer at the moment. All right, so for something new, folks, we're going to do a uh, whole bunch of questions. So I put a post in the More Tribes Facebook group called Ask Me Anything, and um, well, let's go through and answer them. And uh, I may or may not have copped a bit of a flogging in these. So um, first off, we've got uh, Victor Carl Allen Nilsson. So he wants to know, how do you make the pronunciation of ogres less horrible on the tongue? Just realized I could call them Hodors, Ogors, Hodors, almost the same, yes, well, yes, you are right, and um, Ogors, or Ogres, I mean, I just call them Ogres, I find myself automatically default just going to Ogors now when I write it, and um, saying Ogors as well um, is generally creeping in, but I think it's like the A-Elf thing, is that uh, Games Workshop have actually said they still pronounce it as Elves, 
they've just called it AL. So, I mean, whatever. Um, I don't care what you call it, ogres, ogres. I mean, I don't think anyone really cares. So say it how you want to say it. Um, if you're a stickler for pronunciation, then you could go ogres. But um, I mean, really, it's not that much of an issue. The next question from uh, Victor as well. He says, by the way, is there any history of the Moor surviving in the end times? And the answer is yes. And uh, it's a certain bit that got me very excited. So it's in the, um, I believe it's in the core rule book or the Malign Portents book where they're going through the description of the endless spells. And when you get to the description of the Ravenax gnashing Moors, it starts, so essentially um, Ravenax gnashing Moors is the magical embodiment of an entity, right? And so it's um, it, it's the power of this entity unleashed, and the power the the entity is called Ravenac, and it is described as basically being the Moor, um, which was buried under a mountain by Sigma in the early days. So when Sigma is flying around, crushing monsters and doing all the heroic god things that he did, he found this entity Ravenac, which is described as essentially being the Moor. Um, and he's buried it under a mountain. And then so it then goes on to say that Ogre Butchers, it was an Ogre Butcher, which was the first wizard to ever su summon um, Ravenax Gnashing Moors, and that um, they have a uh, an affinity towards the spell, right? So it's basically linking Ogres to the Moor. Um, I'm interested to see whether or not this was just a sort of little side story that they wrote in there or whether or not they've actually incorporated this entity Ravenac, aka the Moor, into the Moor tribes you'd think they would. Um, they do say in the lore that ogres have a certain affinity to the spell and an abil ability to cast it as well. So um, let's hope they can cast the boosted version for a little bit cheaper or make it more effective. Excuse me. Next question is from uh, Heinrich uh, Stehusen. Uh, sorry for my pronunciation, folks. He says, hey man, I think ogres and BCR play exactly how they, sh how they should feel like. My worry is that the rules will become more bland and competitive at the cost of some of the feeling and immersion of them feeling like ogres. What's your take? Well, um, I certainly agree. So... It would be easy to take gut busters, give them rules similar to something like Iron Jaws, and then all of a sudden um, they just feel like another hard-hitting destruction army. But what I want to say is what I personally think gives uh, ogres their unique feeling of playstyle is really being the low model count, the high wounds. So I don't think that's going to go anywhere. Um, there's pluses and negatives to that, right? Because you take more wounds to lose more models, um, but you also struggle to capture objectives, but also you get a really big punch because you're multi-damage, you get a really big punch out of quite a small unit. So you have these small three guys and you go, oh yeah, cool, it's just three ogres. And then they have this big explosive hit and you're like, oh yeah, this is what ogres should be right um so that's what i think gives them the feel and i don't think they're necessarily going to um lose that as well like unless they lost that multi-wound high damage so if they brought the damage back but made them more reliable to hit then that would be a way i think that they normalize the ogres and you could lose some of that feel but for the most part i think um i don't think that's going to happen so i think they're probably going to maintain that um that feel. I guess if you get a whole bunch of flying ogres and things like that, it's going to be problematic, but I don't really expect that. I think that the problems that you have playing ogres in some ways are still going to be the ongoing problems. I think the strengths of playing ogres are still going to be the strengths, um, but they're just going to address some of the your inabilities to compete in the scenarios and, and so forth, as well as um, improve the rules. So Mike Wendell asks, how much red meat do I consume? And is my gut worthy? Well, according to my cholesterol, it is extremely worthy, my friend. Nigel Bartlett asks, how big is your gut? Is it mighty? Well, it is, um, I've got a huge freaking gut. So 3XL size in Australian, which is probably 2XL size in America. But um, my gut is too big, actually, and too mighty. Next up, we have Peter Linquist. And uh, Peter, what a jerk. He says, why do you look like this guy? So he's put a picture of no life guy, as you can see there. 
And I was like, oh, wow, that's really harsh. And then I thought maybe he's talking about the ask me anything I, pitch, I put up. Ding, which is greasiest, which you can see there, because they kind of look the same. But then I took like a quick little screenshot of myself. Ding, and guess what? It's true. I actually look like this guy. So I guess the answer to your question, Peter, is that I just have no life. But how can you kill which that which has no life? So thank you very much. Uh, next, we've got uh, Ryan. He wants... <laughs> Can I talk about ogre games like Punter Runt? Uh, not without saying the word cunt. And um, <laughs> sorry, guys, I'll take that back. I shouldn't have said that. Um, uh, Richard Smith says, Where did you find the recolored Greasius art? Uh, I think that's from uh, Total War 2. It's a bit of Total War 2. I just stole it off the internet. Now, we've got a real question now from Josh Griffiths. And he wants to know Is 12 bulls in a unit too many? And. Um, the answer is no, and the answer is yes as well. So in all of my battle reports, in all of the tournaments I've gone to, um, I have found that Ogre Bulls are most effective in a unit of 12. So you get the um, sort of Horde discount for 12 Ogre Bulls, uh, and so that makes them cheap. You get quite good bank for your buck. There's 48 wounds in that unit, and once they're above 10, you get access to the, the rule to re-roll all failed wounds on the charge. And this is when um, Ogre Bulls really, really, really shine. Like when you charge an enemy unit, you've got 10 plus Ogre Bulls. You're hitting on a four, re-rolling ones with dual hand weapons. I expect that's going to change a lot. The Iron Fist is going to be um, very valuable, but you're hitting on fours, re-rolling ones, and if you've got the butcher buff off, now you're hitting on threes, re-rolling ones, right? So you actually get a ton of hits through, and then you go to wounding on a three, but with a re-roll on the charge, this is where Ogre Bulls just do an absolute ton of damage. So Ogre Bulls are really effective in units of three, they're good in units of sixes as well, but for me personally, I find it's three or 12, right? Three for a little MSU unit of bulls running around, which can still fight like the, um, um, so sorry, unit of three is super effective and they can normally take on most other um, like minimum size battle line units. Um, so they're quite good just to be little roadblocks, to being little orbiting sort of units, to fight anything that might pop down. But um just for the bang for buck, buck on a min max perspective, uh, 12 Ogre Balls are absolutely fantastic and they do a hell of a lot of damage. However, um, they're 400 points and if people know what to expect from them, they can shut them down quite quickly. So you start getting debuffs on that unit, it becomes ineffective. They know that a lot of your damage comes from them being charged. So by them being able to deny the charge of your unit by pinning you on the side and so forth, um, they can really shut down a large percentage of your army. So it's sort of a little bit horses for courses. Previously, and the best results I've had is running two units of 12 in my army, but um, uh, I think it's a little bit like once people know how to deal with it, then um, it's fairly easy to deal with once they know what to expect. But if you catch your opponent off guard, then they hit really quite hard. They're quite good at grinding as well. So even if you do get caught flat footed and you get charged, um, they're you know, 48 wounds. It's only a five up save, which is unfortunate, but um, they can certainly win that prolonged grind with a lot of other units that you might end up in that situation with. The only other thing I'll just say about this is 12 Ogre Bulls supported by either Tyrant with a longer reach that can attack over the top or just simply three Iron Guts is a combination that is really, really successful. So successful. So I normally run 12 Ogre Bulls and then I'll put three Iron Guts just behind them or to the side of them. And then what this means is that if I get charged, if you charge into the 12 Ogre Bulls, that's cool. You deny me that charge bonus, but my Iron Guts can pile in and attack and hit over the top. And it gives your um, block of uh, 12 Ogre Bulls that extra bit of damage that they need to fight their way out of most situations. Or alternatively, if they're worried about charging into my Bulls, because they're going to draw the Iron Guts in, then uh, it frees my balls up to then charge out and get that big re-roll. So um, I would be recommending, for me personally at the moment, without knowing a new book, that one, at least having one unit of 12 Ogre Balls is um, something that you want to have in your arsenal to use for building lists. So um, that's that. So next up, we've got uh, Graham Orham, and he says... Um, 
to start Gut Busters now or wait until the hopeful book or just buy Beast Claw Raiders? Well, for me personally, I think the safe bet is you can go buy Gut Busters, right? So we've certainly got, um, um, you know, we've got the Ogre Bulls, which have been reboxed. We've seen the preview with Lead Belchers, Ogre Bulls, the new Tyrant and so forth as well. So um, I would be suggesting that you'd be completely okay to go start buying your Bulls and your Lead Belchers if you want um, and start painting them up and get them ready to play. Um, Beast Claw Raiders, I've gone and bought two start collecting boxes of Beast Claw Raiders. Now, we don't know whether they're going to get merged or not, but if it's Gut Busters you want to play, go by Gut Busters, not Beast Claw, because what if, hypothetically, they don't merge the two books, right? That's actually a rumor that was circulating for a little while as well. First, we have that they're going to be combined, and then we have that they're not going to be combined. I mean, who knows? I'd put my money on that they are combining, but, um, I mean, I've bought the Beast Claw Raider boxes, and if they don't get combined, I just end up with basically a Beast Claw army, which, like, I'm happy with as well. So um, I think you're better off, you know, because it's more than likely you're going to have, um, it's more than likely that a lot of, you know, more tribe armies, if they are combined, are going to have Gutbuster infantry and then, like, a Stonehorn or two or something stomping around, right? So you can always start buying your Gutbusters now. If they don't get combined, well, you've got your Gutbusters. If they do get combined, then all you need to do is add in like a stone horn or two. Um, so next up we have uh, Bill and uh, Bill says, I, like so many other Ogre players, have now converted most of the Butchers to have Cauldrons and beyond Scrag's base size. Any concern that they'll discontinue the Butcher with a Cauldron and only have the regular Butcher on a 50 mil with the upcoming release? Um, the answer is absolutely yes. So, um, I'll say, well, both of my butchers are the same, right? I've converted one to have a cauldron and the other one is scrag and they're both on that, um, that base size. And, um, I actually expect that they're going to release a new butcher. I don't know anything, but I think they're either going to release a new butcher or they're just going to revert to the existing butcher on a 50 mil without a cauldron, mainly because the, um, the scrag model is like a hundred dollars. It's not, it's in fine cast. It's not really that available. It doesn't make sense to have two butchers with, you know, one with a cauldron, one without at the same points cost. So an easy option for them would be to split them out. Um, as long as they make that, you know, to two different war scrolls with two different points costs and, uh, two different rule sets, as long as, um, both of those, as long as both of those models, um, are available, I think the more logical thing, like what I'd be trying to do if I was re-releasing this book would be to either release a new butcher model, um, with a new war scroll and ob unfortunately obsolete some of those because they're like, um, fine cast or metal. So this is always the thing that's been going around is like, ah, oh, the fine cast are going to go the way of the dodo. Well, we don't have any hard and absolute rule for that. We have Skaven where they still sell fine cast and, and metal models in it, but then in other releases, seemingly the fine cast go. So there's no hard and fast rule. I don't know what to expect, but for me personally, I've accepted in my head, I've just gone, these two butchers are probably going to go, um, and I might have to replace them. Um, and if I do have to replace them, well, that would be unfortunate because I've already got two here, but it's going to be probably be a really cool freaking model. And, um, I've kind of had a lot of value out of these two butchers and I don't actually like how they are. I don't actually like having one that's converted and one being a scrag. And I certainly don't want to have two scrags. Like I, I just hate that two models in the same stuck pose. I don't like at all. Um, and the conversion is very much like, well, here's a kind of tack on. You know, I've bought this extra bit, I've put it on the base, um, just so it's WYSIWYG for the rule purposes, but it's, it, overall, it's just not right, right? The war scroll and the models that we have, it, it just doesn't make quite sense. So they need to do something with it. And um, when they do do something with it, it could mean that unfortunately some of us, you know, we, we have to spend more money on models, which we, we seemingly already have. But I think we just have to be mindful of, okay, this war scroll um, written for these two models was written four years ago before we even had points before we have ever even had anything they had two models that they had had to write a WYSIWYG, WYSIWYG war scroll in 
in the one war scroll, right? And they didn't have any points or anything to constrain them. So, I mean, I would be suggesting that if in those four years you haven't got your value out of your butchers and, um, you know, replacing them is something that really upsets you, that's fair enough. But for me, I've got the value out of them. I'm completely fine with it. And um, because it's like that sacrifice, you know, you kind of, you, you lose some, you take a bit of a hit, but overall you come out uh, good and on top. But it is a real fear. I think that's something that um, you should start saying in your head, this is the most likely thing to happen. And then that way, if it doesn't happen, like it's excellent, it's all good. If it does happen, well, you've already dealt with it, right? Um, Luke Stone says, why ogres? What makes them special? Uh, I know you like to be a decently competitive guy. Gut bases aren't that good, to be fair. Well, screw you, Luke, because they're better than Scourge Privateers. Um, but what is that special thing that what is that special thing that makes them for you? Well, they are the most similar thing to ogres in Forgotten Realms, to be completely honest with you. So there's a combination of things that I've spoken about um, multiple times before. Number one, low model count. I hate high model count armies in Age of Sigma, but they're not that low model count like Stormcast. Well, they're a little bit, they're actually less elite than Stormcast in many ways. I self-identify with them because I am also a big fat man, but um, they're just cool, man. I like that explosiveness of them. Uh, I like the idea of just huge brutal guys just charging into combat and not giving any fucks just one ogre being able to just chop down men with horses and a single blow break any shield wall or snap the spine of a horse that sort of stuff i like it when my iron guts you know there's six models they walk up their board they get surrounded by chaos warriors on the charge um, i end up attacking first and just explode all of them off the table i love that about ogres but also like i said my my fantasy world growing up is really based in you know sort of middle earth and then also um dungeons and dragons and so when i was looking at getting into warhammer fantasy i was looking for an army that best represented a dungeons and dragons style army on the tabletop and ogres are still that for me right i can i can relate ogres um to me both in Warhammer, but also in my entire history, sort of growing up and, and being interested in fantasy. So um, that's sort of why, and I don't know, like, honestly, there's just something about them. Like, I just like them, just big, brutal, strong, um, eat everything, like, they're just what I want. I just like them. That's a dumb answer, I know, right? But whatever. Right, next up, we've got um, Danny Ryan, Labiri, Labir, sorry for my pronunciation again. Knowing what we know, what is your iron gut feeling about the changes and uh, would you see them in the next tome? Well, yes, I think they are definitely going to be in the next tome. I think they'd have to be crazy to get rid of them or they would have to replace them. And given that Mornfang is essentially iron guts on Mornfang, it kind of doesn't seem right to get rid of them all. So, what do I expect? Well, I expect a dramatic points reduction, right? So you, um, I'm hoping a lot of you have seen the Trogoth comparison video I did where I compared Trogoths off their stats to um, uh, both Iron Guts and also to Minotaurs. And the Trogoth are just hands down better uh, across the board. On top of that, they then, since that video, got a points reduction again. So I'm genuinely expecting, even if you just kept, um, I did record an entire video uh, where I went through every single war scroll and um, made some simple recommendations to those war scrolls that would give Gutbusters a huge power boost, but without actually really changing the war scrolls in any significant way. And so, um, for example, with Iron Guts, it would be as simple as changing the Iron Guts rule to, instead of it being dependent on another um, model from another Gutbusters unit running away during the game to be able to use it, you could just use it once per game at whim, right? So just being able to choose when your Iron Guts use, leave it up to the Iron Guts, would be a massive boost for them. If you then combine that with just a simple points drop, right, to bring them down to 140 probably, even though at 140, their damage output is still not as good as Trolls. They don't have the built-in minus one to hit or anything like that. But if you dropped Iron Guts to 140 and let them use that, leave it up to the Iron Guts rule at whim, 
like without making any significant changes to the war scroll or anything like that, just a quick change, all of a sudden they become absolutely fucking baller and amazing. So at the minimum, I would expect to see that sort of change, right? Significant points drop and then just some simple tweaks. Um, the whole army kind of hits on fours and that may be something they want to keep, but um, making something like Iron Guts hitting on threes, like, holy shit, if Iron Guts were hitting on threes and threes like trolls, Native on Rend, three damage would leave it up to the Iron Guts. Woo, that would be um, something special for sure. So Connor Flynn says, talk about the glorious site that was the Ogre Stronghold, plus why do we need to bring it back? Well, I don't know if we need to bring it back because we've got the More Tribes Facebook page now, and we've also got TGA, which I don't use. But um, to be honest with you, the Ogre Stronghold was the first place that I ever went. So I started um, collecting Ogres in like 7th edition Warhammer Fantasy, and that was the first place that I went just to try and learn anything I could about the army that I just started to buy. So um, lots of lots of early memories of the best information that I got, but I have to say that I hate forums, like I hate forums completely. And, um, and I stay away from them like the plague. So I didn't actually spend much time on the Ogre Stronghold, I'm sorry. Um, next up we have uh, Jacob. Uh, he says, speculate on the fun thematic rules that may be coming with the book that's always fun well fun thematic rules well there there are a few gimmies that go straight to my head so firstly you do impact um, wounds on the charge this has always been a thing with ogres um, it's a tricky one because to be honest with you you could very much end up in a situation where um, it's too easy to stack if you take MSU units of ogres and um, heroes and all of a sudden you're doing impact wounds on the charge you know you're just charging multiple small units into the one unit and you're doing just a ton of mortal wounds so um it's something i'd like to see because it's just thematic and it's what ogres have always done it's in the fluff it's in their lore um but you know it's kind of the low-hanging fruit right um and it's also an easy one to get wrong to be either too strong or too weak um the other one is a fat save right fire slavers have a hair save um the the four up and um even in the law of ogres, so ogres have their vital organs in their guts or in behind their guts. They wear the gut plate and that's why they don't wear any other armor, right? Because if they take wounds to their body, the flesh and muscle parts of their body, it really doesn't have any impact on them as far as killing them. So ogres can just charge in, hit hard, they protect the gut, and then they can just fight and grind and fight and grind. And they can get stabbed with spears, cut with swords, shot with weapons, and it won't kill them it won't slow them down it won't hurt them unless you get to those vital organs so for that purpose alone like a fat save say a five up fat save seems to make sense right because you're doing this damage to me but i'm so resilient because of my biology that um it just doesn't really go through so um you know that's another rule i could see getting implemented and um the third one probably the the give me is just a simple one that um corresponds to their hunger and the fact they're always eating and they're eating what they kill as well so this rule is not particularly strong but it would be an easy rule to work into the book um as an allegiance ability which wouldn't have any it won't have any real significant impact but you don't have to worry about it breaking things either and that is similar to the blood gruel um rule from the war herd so the minotaurs have a rule that when they destroy a unit they heal basically d3 wounds right and that would be the same thing for the ogres right whenever they wipe a unit out um, they heal d3 wounds or d6 wounds whatever it is you want it to be um, and that sort of thematically works right so they charge they do impact wounds they have a fat save because they're resilient because they're biology and they eat what they kill constantly so when they destroy a unit they heal so if it's just on your unit of 12 ogre bulls you heal d3 wounds well it's a nice bonus but it doesn't change anything it doesn't bring back models or whatever but on your ogre tyrant once your ogre tyrant like um once your ogre tyrant does a ton of damage uh and destroys a unit him healing d3 wounds can be quite significant so um i think that would be cool um larry barry <sighs> Larry Barber asks, how much can a Nobler actually steal as much as he can carry, obviously? 
and what are ogre pants made from the tears of their enemies next up we've got sam ashbow he says first off i want to salute you and thank you for being a great ambassador and representative of ogres thank you very much sam that's very lovely pardon me he says it's been a long road for our ogres your channel has been fantastic thank you thank you thank you so thank you thank you man eaters you love them um you want to talk about them I like to hear your thoughts about them and their potential future. I know on your record is looking to even more. Okay. So, um, I've already spoken about that in the previous section with the, um, so my concerns are that they're going to get squashed, just moved into mercenaries, even though we've been told that's kind of not what's going to happen. I think that is going to happen. However, I hope they just stay, um, in the army. I hope what they do is they take the kits, right? Because there's, I think there's eight different sculpts of man eaters. Um, off the top of my head and i'd love to see them just go to a unit of four you get four fine cast um you put them in the one box right so it's the ninja the man eater the imperial whatever it is um box that up into one sell it for 120 bucks whatever i don't care make the unit size from three to four and then also and then get the other four and put them in the opposite box so you can buy two boxes of man eaters would come in units of four. There's four fine cast models in each box. You buy both boxes to have the entire collection, and then they become your super elite, reliable guys, right? With the special um, rules out there. So um, definitely threes and threes to hit. Minus actually, their attack profile at the moment is fine. Threes and threes, re-rolling ones, like is pretty good. Um, but they just need more special rules, right? Um, they need to be like threes and threes, re-rolling ones for everything, re-rolling charges, have a decent shooting attack. Like you, man eaters need to be really feared. Um, they don't need to be iron guts, for example. You still want to have that distinguishment where you go, wow, iron guts have that massive spike damage, but you just want um, man eaters to be like, oh, God, shit, these guys do everything well. Uh, they're, they're the best models, I think, in the whole range, and they look awesome. So, um points drop like drop them drop them down to 160 um make them re-roll ones on everything make them re-roll charges automatically keep their attack profile pretty much the same and um that'd be fine and then once you stack on like allegiance buffs or spell buffs or whatever like they could become absolutely devastating so um that's that how do ab ogres actually breed we never see any females um plus we hear stories of how they eat their own children it's amazing they haven't caused their own extinction. Well, I'm pretty sure that ogres fuck like rabbits, to be honest with you. I mean, um, and there are certainly females. We have a female man-eater. She's carrying a giant rolling pin on her um, on her shoulder. She may or may not have a beard, but that's neither here nor there. So I think the thing that you can reliably think that ogres do is fight, eat, and fuck. So, um, yep, they have babies and... Um, the babies are little fat brawlers, and um, I mean, I can just see ogre babies just like smashing noblars, like that would be the cruelest little fucks around. But um, sure, they eat their own babies. We have stories of the butcher, like in the old, old law, that um, takes ogre infants and bites into their stomach to claim them. Um, so, I mean, it's not a nice world, but um, it is what it is. They certainly have babies. Uh, what do ogres spend their money on? I mean, we can see it ain't weapon, armor, or clothes. We know they eat what they kill. So, yeah, it's all gone on bad investments. Also, this is from Paul Marshall. And um, I'm pretty sure you're 100% right. It is all gone on bad investments. So, um, firstly, well, I think they buy a lot of pants. Um, I don't think those pants would really last long and they're ever expanding, so they always need new pants. I think an ogre would pretty much hand in his entire hoard for a feathered hat um because they're expensive and you can't normally get them but that's the sort of thing i can see they're like about to eat the merchant and take all his stuff and all of a sudden he convinces them that instead of doing that why don't you pay me all your gold and i'll give you this shiny and the ogre is like that's a good deal let's go uh justin uh deval says he loves the show so um cool thank you very very much uh, we've just quickly got some uh so just on youtube uh, on the community section of youtube we have got some questions as well let me go to those my channel community okay so we put a post up here in the community as well um and uh six comments let's go 
He says he's been wondering where Grots fit into the More Tribes release. Will they get new rules to encourage us to play Hordes, or will, will they be ignored because no one likes them? Okay, so this is a good question because it actually ties back into another question which I thought was here but seems to have been gone. So there's been a bit of a push and for um, Ogres as well to um, have... So for Ogres to um, count as multiple models for the score, uh, purposes of scoring objectives. So, you know, four wound model count, uh, sorry, four wound model counts as four models on objectives. And I just want to say that I absolutely don't want to see this. Um, this is the worst thing I want to see because firstly, it's the trade-off that we always have in Age of Sigma with elite armies, right? It's the, the, the natural deterrent for elite armies. They uh, do more damage, they hit harder, they have more wounds, they have more rules, they're better quality per model. And so that's the trade-off, right? You do more damage and you hit harder, but you lose out on the model count. And that's what you need to balance. Um, the thing is, is that with, say, um, Beast Law Raiders, right? It's very, it's probably more um, prevalent than what it is for gut busters. Because to be honest with you, 12 Ogre Bulls or six Iron Guts, if you charge into an enemy unit, be it, um, you know, be it, um, um, like 40 clan rats or whatever it is, you know, other battle line unit that you're charging into, after a turn of fighting, they're fucking dead. Like, you're competing for that objective on models. And yeah, sometimes you lose on model count, but that's what gives gut busters a lot of their flavor. So it's probably worse with Beast Claw Raiders because Beast Claw are so low model count. But, um, like, I have to say, once you combine Beast Claw Raiders back into um, more tribes, if that happens, sorry, with Gutbusters, well, a lot of those problems go out the window because you're now given the complete option. Listen, you can take all of this infantry, you can can, uh, can take Noblars and these sorts of things, which give you the option to, um, to remove that weakness from your army. Or if you want to just play four or five big monsters, the sacrifice of that is model count so even with flesh eater courts you know flesh eater courts have this well they don't really have the problem they take a few min units of um, ghouls but then they can summon heaps on right but it's still that um that same thing of big beasties low model count right and if you put it into gut busters or more tribes where multi-wound models count um for more models and objectives then it just adds that to the design space of age of sigma and we're going to see it bleed across into other armies as well. And the last thing I want in the world is something like Archaon or Nagash or whatever it is, counting as like 20 or 16 models on um, for objective purposes. I just don't like it. Even with Stonehorns and so forth, it's like, okay, we'll let a Stonehorn count as 14 models, right? If he's got 14 wounds. That's the thing we're going to do. But then in order to like keep it some semblance of balance, He's not going to get any elite abilities. We're not going to give him buffs by spell laws. We're not going to change his war scroll or whatever it is. Because if you just have stone horns at the moment that count as 16 models, that's it. That's all your buffs you need, right? So you just got to, I think, um, accept it. But um, so the question is from um, uh, Paul. He's been wondering where Grots fit into the More Tribes release. Will they get new rules to encourage us to play Horde? Or will they be ignored because no one likes them? Well, um, I have to say... <coughs> Excuse me. At the moment, Noblars are one of the most powerful units in the Gutbusters book. Now, I don't like them because I don't like playing with high model count armies. Like one of the reasons I play Gutbusters is so I don't have to take lots of little fuck ass 25 mil um, models. I don't think they're going to get ignored. I think they're going to get built up. And an interesting idea I have is you see with the um, Ogre Bulls repackage that they took the little base Noblars and actually put them on their own 25 mils. So one cool way that you could address both of the issues I just spoke about is that you have a unit of 12 bulls and for every three ogres in the unit, you get one Noblar, it's a mixed unit, right? And that Noblar, he obviously has his own attack profile, but he's still a part of that unit. So when you take wounds, you have the option. Do I take the Noblars away from the um, unit of bulls first? And as so they absorb wounds, but I lose model count fast. Or do I apply the wounds onto the ogre bulls, keep the noblars in the unit, and that way I um, absorb wounds um, and I lose. I, I keep my model count, but I lose my punching power. 
that's the best way I think you could do it. And um, the Iron Guts as well, they have the Noblars that go on the bases, they all sort of do. So pretty much any box of Gut Busters that you buy, um, you get a free wound or a free model count with it. And now all of a sudden your 12 Ogre Bulls goes from a unit of 12 Ogre Bulls, from 12 Ogre Bulls to uh, 12 Ogre Bulls and 6 Noblars. You're now counting for 18, um, uh, 18 models instead. So you don't change the dynamics of how the wounds and model count works in Age of Sigma at all. Simply you just add those little 25 mil grots um, into those unit and it actually is like it fits the law perfectly. In the law you have ogres stomping around and you have noblars as their little helpers, right? They do the jobs that the ogres do or don't want to do and in return they don't get eaten, right? So it makes sense to me um, that that would be a great way that you could use the existing models. You could address one of the problems that they have. Um, you could fit it in narratively as well. And um, it wouldn't be too ridiculous, right? 12 Ogre Balls and 6 like Noblars in that unit. Um, that's fine. I don't think it's too complicated as well. Um, so that's that. So the Thirsty Goblin, he said a number of objectives. Um, he says also a lot of Gutbuster Man Eater models are out of stock online at the moment. So let's just check that, see if they are not in Australia. So Games Workshop, do, 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 do. Games Workshop I just wrote. And we're going to check. We'll have Age of Sigma. We're going to go down to Destruction, uh, Gut Busters, and we've got Man Eaters. Uh, um, uh, in stock, fire bellies temporarily unavailable. Um, yeah, you're right. So man eaters, uh, ogres are out of stock. Uh, iron guts are out of stock. Uh, but it's all says temporarily out of stock. So um, I think these are all being rebased. Yep, the man eaters rebased, noblars rebased, iron guts rebased. Um, that's all sweet. This is a, a good sign, I think. So. Um, Yep, no problems at all there. I don't think they're... Maybe they aren't going anywhere. Right, next up we've got um, Adrian Binko wants to know if I'll visit Omar when I'm in Melbourne. I'm not visiting Omar. I don't like fucking cats. If I was around that cat, I'd fucking eat it. Okay, Adrian, love you. Hey, cats. Next we've got uh, Zemorgul. I am horrible with these names. Speculation is always fun. Perhaps a bit of guesswork on rules and ideas for the fat boys. Uh, I think we've already gone through that as well. Um, so that's fine. Mitch Gaming says bring on Bush Bash. Yep, I agree. Um, <laughs> uh, Adrian says, I couldn't agree more, Michael. But Omar is not that dog there. He's that big cat. The biggest house cat in the world. I still Okay, the bigger he is, the bigger snack he'll be. But... Um, yeah, not that interested, unfortunately. So that's it for um, uh, Just As Deadly, Ask Me Anything. And um, uh, if you've got any other questions or you want me to talk about anything else, then please leave a comment below. Remember, like, comment, subscribe, all helps the channel. And um, make sure you're subscribed for the giveaways as well. All right, so uh, I know in the last episode of uh, Doomcast, I said that we had uh, Benico Bushbash coming up and I was going to be taking my uh, my ogres, my uh, MSU ogres, and um, that was going to be the you know last hurrah for my ogres under um, Gutbusters before more tribes. And um, we tested the list out. You can see that in the battle report against the Ideneth Deepkin. I'll, um, there should be a little thing popping up now. You can click on that, go watch that battle report if you want. And um, the list actually worked excellent, but what didn't work excellent is we um, just rolled up a random scenario. And um, because of what you see on the screen, we'll talk about this more in a second, but um, we rolled up a random scenario, got relocation orb and um, against Ideneth Deepkin. And I'm just looking at the table and I'm like, well, that's it. Whether or not I even have a chance to participate or, or compete in this game comes entirely down to the dice roll because the nature of gut busters um, and uh, deployment and movement 
Uh, if it bounces away from you, you've got no way of chasing it, no fast wizards, no teleportation, um, nothing that can run and charge, um, nothing like that at all. So I'm purely at the whim of it bouncing towards me and then me trying to defend it. And so um, you're sort of left with a bit of a situation when you go, okay, this is cool. I want to go to this tournament and I want to play my gut busters, but uh, this is the portion of the players pack for Bendigo Bush Bash. And so it says it'll be using five of the 18 match play battle plans, six from the core rule book, 12 from the general's handbook. Given the nature of the event, we decided not to add custom scenarios for the event. Good. And then it says the battle plans will be chosen prior to the event, but you will not find out which ones they are until the day. So um, this has two effects. One, you can't tailor your list for um, Bush Bash, um, like for the scenario. So you can't write a list that is good for the different packs and then play that. Uh, and you also can't practice them as well. Like you just don't know um, what you're going to get. I mean, someone does. Um, the thing that you have to question yourself about this is you go, well, Joel McGrath is playing in the event and um, he's who I pay for the event and then NC Dave has received all the lists and collated all the lists. So I don't know who the TO is. Uh, both of those people are playing in the event. So I wonder if they know what the battle plans are already. And if some players in the event know what the battle plans are, but others aren't, aren't don't, then that seems a bit odd. And, um, and if I don't know who the TO is and whether or not they're playing in the event or not, but surely the TO who knows which battle plans these are um, isn't playing in the event because that would seem like a conflict of interest. It's not really a concern for me because, uh, well, I'm not playing to win. I don't really care. I just want to have five games of Warhammer and have a heap of fun. But um, uh, certainly this is something that is concerning to others. So the fact that I've got no idea what scenarios I'm going to be playing at the event, can't try and make a, don't even know, um, you know, if I know in advance, then I can go, yes, my gut busters, I can make a gut busters list at least gives me some chance against some of the scenarios, but I have no idea what this could be. This could be four or three scenarios where it all takes wizards to capture. I don't even, <laughs> even know if that exists anymore. Um, but you get the point, right? It, it could just be anything. It could all be lengthways um, games like these guys that have quite a spread out area. So it, you could literally have any battle plan worked in here and um, not knowing you really have to take a list and an army that enables you to compete in the scenario. Um, it would be horrible to rock up with my best gut busters list and then find out that my best gut busters list as far as being able to fight actually has no way of defending four objectives in my territory and taking you know objectives in their territory for example um, so you kind of well I have to play something that at least no matter what comes up I have a chance to participate because as much as I love playing gut busters I can't just go to a tournament with like this with gut busters and just what risk it on on you know whatever they've sort of chosen so um unfortunately and because of this reason we're going with Skaven um that's right so there's sort of like when I consider that okay I don't know what scenario I'm going to get right battle line wizards could capture more models on the objective could capture it could be six it could be four it could be eight um different objectives on the table um it could be played width it could be played lengthways like who fucking knows right so um when you start to weigh it up like you know unfortunately the gut busters as much as i love you i just don't want to and i want to have that three gts in the one tournament season with them as well uh just you know i'd rock up and <coughs> excuse me five games the scenarios all go against me and end up on zero losses and think well why the fuck did i even bother to come here if my army that i love playing doesn't even have a chance in any of the scenarios based off the random scenarios that came up well they're not even random they know but they're just not telling us so gut busters, busters versus Skaven. Well, here we go. Old book versus new, right? Skaven, they have magic, right? They have bonuses to cast. They have multiple spell laws and they have good spell laws as well. They have teleportation. They have teleportation built into the army by their free terrain that they get, right? So something that nothing in my gut buster army can really do. Oh, I should say there are gorges and there are um, hunters which can ambush on, but they don't really count 
in the scheme of things. And on top of um, teleportation through the um, null holes, you've also got things like skid leap, you know, so you can get around the table. Skaven have fantastic shooting, and in the current meta, with um, all of the big bads out there, like shooting is something that you want. They've got high rend, they've got mortal wounds, so they've got some answers to um, units like that. If they if they come up, they've got lots of bodies, so they can compete. And um, I mean, they're the reasons why Skaven is still like one of the better armies out there. There are a lot of really good armies out there at the moment, but at this tournament, there's 42 players, and I think there's six Skaven, including me. So it's um, it's crazy, but um, you know, it gave me. I've had my Skaven sitting here for a long, long time, not complete, like not cohesive. So the only Skaven that I had done in a uniform sort of way are the, all the Skaven I used for my Mixed Chaos previously. So my Storm Fiends, my Warp Seer, my Vermin Lord Deceiver. Um, I used to play all of those in Mixed Chaos. So basically if you take like Beastman, Skaven, and then chuck in some Varangard, that was essentially my Mixed Chaos that I took to, to multiple different tournaments. Um, and so I was like, this was my excuse to polish off a Skaven tied army and get um, all the little bits. I would have been here a long time ago if clan rats weren't a minimum of 20. I just hate playing high model count armies. And even when I take like three min units of 20, for me, that's still a lot. Like I have more models in my minimum battle line than I would prefer to play with in my entire army in Age of Sigma. So I wonder if it's, I wonder if, you know, this little frog guy down the corner of my picture is annoying anyone else it's certainly triggering me so let's take a look at the uh, list well it's pretty simple really and um, it's not very good um, but I think I'll have fun with it anyway so um, basically how this sort of evolved is I was in bed I was thinking you know what I want to just take a low model count Skaven army like as low as I can and I thought I want to take um because I had six storm fiends here but they were still um, either warp fire throwers, like four warp fire throwers, two doom flayers, because they're the holdover from before the, the Skaven Tide book came out. And um, I thought I want to play Storm Fiends because like the models are awesome. I really like them. I've used them in multiple tournaments in the past. I've got a bit of a soft spot for them. Um, and here's a way that I can just take some big models that people don't really use and um, have some fun with them and come up with a different sort of Skaven list, list than what's run at the moment, you know, Gisales and Plague Monks and all that fun interactive sort of stuff. And so I was looking at them and I was like, oh, okay, well, I can use Deranged Inventor, Inventor and I can um, reroll hits from shooting and then I can use a Warp Spark and they turn damage too. And I was like, hang on, these Rattling Cannons, um, you know, all of a sudden, hitting on fours with re-rolls um, and then Vigor Dust Injector, hang on, hitting on threes with re-rolls, damage two. I was like, that's actually really, really good. And then you combine a little bit of more, more warp power in there as well. And all of a sudden I'm like, huh, here we go. Like these are actually just gonna walk across the table, like blasting shit away. So I wanted to, um, I made a few lists with 12 Storm Fiends. So it was like two units of six, one with the warp fire throwers, the other with um, that was still all just shooting rattling guns and the um, the wind wind globe launchers, whatever they're called. And I thought, well, this one can kind of hang back a bit and decimate stuff at mid or long range. The other one can push up the board and with the warp fire throwers, just clear off objectives. Um, I thought, okay, this is cool. This is the sort of list I'm going to go for, 12 Storm Fiends and um, a Hellpit Abomination, I think, and then just like Arch Warlocks, really. And um, But still with like minimum um, battle line as being Clan Rats because I don't just want to take all um, Storm Fiends. I played um, Scryer when their uh, Elite's ability first came out in the GHB. Um, so I had a whole heap of games with just Storm Fiends as battle line and... Um, like it was cool and it was actually pretty strong, but like once you pop up, once you do what you need to do, the enemy just has to move away from you. And as soon as you lose one or two units, like you've got massive holes in your army. So I knew that playing just all scry is not um, where I wanted to or needed to be. And so um, anyways, when I'm making up this list, I then realized that to get going from six Storm Fiends that I already have with four warp fire throwers, to 
be able to expand that out to get the new combination of Storm Fiends, as in the book with a variety of weapons, I needed to buy like 18 Storm Fiends, right? And then I could get from those 18 Storm Fiends, I could essentially build 12 with the right configurations that I'd like, and I could sell off the others and, um, and it'd be fine. So that's what I did. I bought like 18 Storm Fiends and, um, and as soon as I put out a post saying I want to buy some Storm Fiends, Dan Brewer messaged me. He's like, oh, you're uh, onto Storm Fiends, are you? And I was like, yeah, you know, just a bit of a fun, different list. I think it's like they're the best unit in Skaven. I'm like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Like, cool. And then literally the next thing I start to see is on Twitter, like um, Ben Saver and um, Jack Armstrong and all these guys in the UK just like Storm Fiend, Storm Fiend, Storm Fiend, Storm Fiend. And I'm like, oh my God. It's like the catcher in the rye thing. Like every time you look the other way, someone sneaks up beneath you and <laughs> writes, fuck you. And um, I always thought that saying was, every time you think you found something new, you kick over a rock to find someone's written fuck you on it. Um, but that's how I feel. I'm like, yeah, cool. This is something new. This is something different. I can just play with some Storm Fiends. And then... Um, you know, I, I won't feel like I'm playing Plague Monks and Giselles and that kind of stuff. And then literally next second, everyone's like, Storm Fiends, ah, and I'm like, oh, great. And um, anyway, so I started building the list and I wasn't sure at this point whether or not, uh, well, I certainly wasn't going to be, at this point, I was still taking Gut Busters to um, Bush Bash. So um, once I sort of had that game against the Ideneth Deepkin and I'm thinking to myself, well, I just can't do this with the Gut Busters in this sort of tournament. I was like, okay, it has to be Skaven. And then all of a sudden I was faced with the timeframes of um, trying to get everything ready. So I had a list that was like two, um, two Vermin Lords and six Storm Fiends and Hellpit Abomination and stuff like that. And then just as it sort of went, I was like, you know what? I need to just, because I've got a lot of work to do, mostly with the clan rats and, and the crap. And I was like, you know what? I just need to, I just need to take what I've got and what I've got that's ready, right? That's what I need to do. I just need to get the models I have, get what I think is cool and just take that down and, and play. Like we're not playing for sheep stations. We're not playing to win. It's like Warhammer, right? Go have five fun games. So just take the cool stuff that you like. And I was like, sweet, no worries. So Arch Warlock, right? He's my number one guy and he goes with my six Storm Fiends and he buffs them and that's all cool. Thank Wall and Bone Ripper, right? So Thank Wall is like a big trap, but at the same time, he's also really cool, right? He gives me magic casting. Um, he's still basically a Vermin Lord. He's got, my guy's got um, four uh, Warp Fire Thralls equipped. That's how I've played him for a long. I used to, play him like I've played him in one day tournaments before and I used to play him where I could skid leap him around cast two spells with him blast with the warp fires and throw in and then charge in and smash stuff he works different now but um but it's cool so I had um so thank you bone ripper and he kind of in some ways performs the role that that second um unit of storm fiends would do with the warp fire throws but he doesn't he really combines like your magic casting capability with that as well um he's not obviously you know he's not 30 wounds he's not any of that sort of stuff he's 400 points he's a big unit but um he gives me some anti-horde capacity he gives me um strong magic phase as well and um so i'm like and also like it's thank all right thank all bone ripper so cool so I'm like, yep, no worries, chuck him in there. Um, he was already ready to go. I don't need to do anything with him. Vermin Lord Deceiver, yeah, you know, I've taken him on how many dozens of tournaments? Well, not dozens, but I've taken him to half a dozen tournaments in the past. And um, uh, the, he is the darkness. You all know him and love him. And so I'm like, yep, chuck the Deceiver in because he's probably my like favorite Vermin Lord as far as not rules, but just being cool. Um, he's got high rend. Um, he's got skid leap, so if it's like relocation orb and things like that, he can chase the orb around. Negative two to hit and shooting, so if someone's got a big shoot, shooting block or something like that, you know, I can send him after them. Um, whatever, that's cool. And I'm like six storm fiends, yep. So that gives me like range, um, you know, and then three units of twenty clan rats. Just wanted to like obviously more clan rats are better, right? Like it's a no brainer. But um, I don't want to play all those clan rats. I freaking hate it. 
I don't want to move the models around. Even this is actually pain and torturous to me. And um, so, you know, I'm just taking the minimum because that's all I want to play with. They're two units of giant rats. So I actually had um, like exactly about 240 points to spare. And at this point, I could just put in my Hell Pit Abomination because I really want to put in my Hell Pit Abomination. But I know that when you have uh, big units like Thanquall and you have like uh, six Storm Fiends and stuff like that, you really need to tech protect them. So you can't have like the same unit providing being multiple roles you can't just have like these are my three units of 20 clan rats and they're going to be my chaff and my unit objectives and they're also going to screen my back line and you're like they can't do all of it you just don't have enough um so I, originally i did have like the warp lightning vault vortex and things like that in there but um like i just uh i don't like it anymore um, so I took that out. So we've just got then two units of 10 giant rats because they're cheap. They move eight and, um, they're just screens and chaff walls for me. And in this army, like with Thankwall and his warp fires and also the storm fiends, like you need two walls of chaff, um, two layers of chaff, because otherwise they'll just get blown through on the double turn and you're going to be laid bare and you're going to take your big expensive units off. Um, so you just need those two units to set up and um, and that's what they are for. I haven't mentioned, but I've actually got two, I have three endless spells in here. I've got the, um, what is it, the Vermin Swarm. I've got the Purple Sun and I've also got the Pendulum as well. So just a bit of fun, you know, the Vermin Lord Deceiver can teleport, throw that Pendulum out, rip it around. Thank Wall can just rip out that big freaking Purple Sun on 3D6 and um, and then I can have a Vermintide uh, running around as well. I really like that spell because, you know, it's like 13 dice, each six does a wound on when I move it. And then also if anyone finishes a move within it, but um, my units aren't affected by it. And also my units can move over it like they can fly. So it's a really good sort of just blocking unit and just pain in the bum thing to have out there. Um, and then as far as the dynamic of moving purple spells, uh, per, uh, moving endless spells with a double turn, it doesn't matter if my opponent moves the Vermintide back on me because I'm not affected by it. The pendulum can only get moved in one direction, so that's fine. So it's just the purple sun, which has, you know, the chance of coming back and you can generally throw that out pretty far and um it's just another fun thing right so that's my list that's what i'm going to take and um i don't really expect it's going to be very good but it's going to be like a lot of fun because um the vermin lord is like one of my favorite guys right just teleports around stabs everything and um and i just have a real sentimental attachment to him because of how much i've, I've used him thank you and bone ripper i just love as well and i have to say like when you just get the warp fire gauntlets out and you're like what i roll 100 dice or i roll 120 dice and every four up is a mortal wound you're like here we go like you could just average that you could just dice up it and drop of a hat or do whatever it is you want to do because you know what the outcome is going to be but it's kind of like cool just rolling the dice and being like 10 20 30 mortal wounds oh yeah let's keep going um so that's fun like and he's just he's just cool as well and um yeah, so everything that's in here, like, I just like playing with. It's kind of cool. And it all does something like, ooh, how much damage are my Rattling Guns going to do now? Ooh, how much damage are my Warp Fire Throwers going to do? Ooh, come on, can my um, Vermin Lord Deceiver spike this guy's skull? You know, so it's all like, let's see what's going to happen sort of stuff. And um, that way, like, no matter what, because I've sort of rushed this all together. And um, it's like my my non-competitive year right like we're just playing for funds um i'm kind of like well no matter what happens in the game win or lose or how it plays out at some point i'm going to be out a bit about to put my warp fire um hoses on someone and um at some point i'm just going to be able to like spike the enemy general's skull with my deceiver and so um yeah it's going to be going to be fun i think i might i just hope i don't get sick of moving these bloody clan rats and stuff around like i kind of want to kill myself just thinking about it but um we'll see how we go um so i've only got one game in with the list that's the other thing like i've got no practice in with the list um um like i can't expect to do well because i'm i have experience with all of these models um in tournaments but it's like spread out over the last two years and not in 
Vermintide. This will be the first time actually, sorry, our Vermintide Skaven Tide, actually first time playing with all these models combined in Skaven Tide. And, um, you know, so I kind of have experience using all of them and I know how they all work. And I've played against Skaven Tide, but I don't have a lot of experience actually playing with it like I do with Gut Busters and so forth. So, and I, I always think that's one of the most critical um, components of playing playing Tournament Sigma. But um, so anyways, I've only got one practice game in. I'm just going to give you a rundown of how this was. This was played down at the Southern World Gamers Club, so I couldn't make a video about a report of it at all. And I, and I just wanted to, didn't really care how this played out because I just wanted to take a chance to get familiar with the rules and things like that. Um, so I got to play against uh, the Night Haunt, and he's got the um, the Shrieker host. Sorry, my son and wife are having fun in the bath. So if you hear weird noises, that's what's going on. Um, that actually sounds weird as well, but they are mucking around. My son's in the bath, and my wife is um, trying to clean him and mucking around. So um, anyway, so yeah, played against Night Haunt, and he had a double battalion Night Haunt he, with the Shrieker host. So the Shrieker host is like negative to my bravery, but also means I can't use the Inspiring Presence um, command ability, which is actually huge and super good. And then he has like the, I think it's called like the Knight Riders, or whatever battalion as well, Black Coach and Hex Raiders and things like that. So what you're looking at here is um, half his army is starting off the board. He's got these um, giant units of hex raids set up off the side ready to pop on. So he's like a very low dropper army. I'm like a nine drop or something like that. And we're playing, uh, is it Blood and Glory or Border War, the new version? So there's basically um, objective here, here. Yeah, it's like four objectives. I think it's Border War again, but the um, length of the, like instead of playing across, we're playing the, the lengthways now. So he has the option to go first. He takes the first turn and he just comes in. So he's got these um, Dread Scythe Harridans, which come down. It's really cool to see units on the table that you don't normally see and play against. I, I find it's like super enjoyable. I should just say with my deployment, we just set up with like, you know, I've got a screen of 20 rats here. I've got another screen of 20 rats coming all the way down, wrapping around. I've got 20 rats here in blobs on movement trays. And then all of my big guys are just zoned off in the center. We've got giant rats here covering the back. And then I've got another unit of giant rats making that uh, double chaff wall here. So double chaff walls at the front, um, the zoning off my back, uh, deceiver hiding up in the back, ready to just jump or do whatever he needs to do. So my opponent takes first turn, and um, as far as he's concerned, he thinks the black coach is a hunk of shit. And um, <laughs> but you know it has to be dealt with. Um, it's a tax from his battalion, so he's got it. But he's just like throw it in and um, let it start killing stuff and uh, do what it does. So Dread Scythe Harridans come down. Um, black coach shoots straight up um, three inches away from me because it can absolutely fly that thing. And then he charges in. So he gets a charge and he gets like a, a nine. So normally Night Haunt have to get to fight in the charge phase if they roll like a charge of 10 or more. But I think it's the Shrieker host um, battalion that he's got that actually lets that go off on a nine. So he charges in here and um, fights with the Dread Scythe Harridans in the charge phase and actually kills 10 of the clan rats. So I just take them away here so that I maintain my, my double chaff wall. Um, he charges his black coach in, and um, this is another problem of both my chaff walls meet at this point. So he can charge in and tag both my chaff walls. There's really no need for me to set up like that. It's much better to have the one chaff wall that wraps around the whole way through so that in this instance, he'd only be charging one unit as opposed to two and uh, doing what he needs to do. Now in the um, the combat phase, uh, he activates the pile in and the Harridans, because they can fly, actually can just hop over my first chaff wall. So he, because he, he knows that I can't make my clan rats immune to battle shock. Um, they're super low bravery. They're lower bravery because of the Night Haunt. He's already done like 10 wounds to me and I can't make him pass. So he pretty much knows they're going to blow up from Battleshock. So instead of attacking them, he piles in, flies over the top with his pile in, and now he can get into my second chaff wall. So this was super effective. The Shrieker host, the inability to use my Battleshock combined, uh, Battleshock immunity, 
combined with flying Josiah Harridans meant that this one unit of 10 um, was able to clear both of my chaff walls in basically one charge phase. So on the right hand side, you can see what it looked like after the um, uh, after the combats were resolved. So um, both chaff walls on this side are gone. Um, he's actually got into combat here with me with um, uh, with Thankwell, and then um, this yellow lot that I had coming all around here. They're pretty much dead. Like I've only got like four left after Battleshock here. I try and retreat them out to head towards that objective. But um, uh, I was like, this was his turn one. And he just came in. Most of his big hard units, like hard hitting units, his big units of hex rays and stuff are off the table. So I can't even get at them or do any damage to them. And he's come in turn one and just cleared all my chaff almost. And I'm like, oh shit, I'm just exposed. I've only got uh, this unit of clan rats here left and then the other guys as well. Um, so we go into my turn and um, well, we get to put the Storm Fiends and um, pardon me, Mr. Thankwell and Bone Ripper to the test. So what happens? Well, Thankwell puts the fucking warp fire throwers onto those Dread Scythe Harridans and they explode in a cloud of mortal wounds and the uh, rattling guns uh, uh, fire up and take that black coach out. The wind globe launches as well, like they hit, but um, like a four up ethereal armor save, they're really effective when that's not the case. So he was like making those armor saves, but the sheer volume of fire from the rattling guns was just enough to take that um, coach off. So that's fine. So I'm like, okay, that's fine. End of turn one, he's killed all my chaff. I took the things off the table that killed my chaff. Um, Priority is gonna be huge, right? Because if I win it, then I might be able to get my chaff walls in place, put some pressure on him somewhere with the deceiver where he can't just come in pop out of the grave and hammer me but he wins the initiative and look at his forces here they go so um the hex rays pop up there more hex rays here more harridans or blade guys revenants i can't remember and then the knight of shrouds here as well so um and he's just got like an open run i've got my uh 20 uh clan rats here still but he's got this open area straight in there at me straight in at thank wall straight in at my storm fiends as well and, um, you know, so it's his turn. He can use his extra attacks from his Knight of Shrouds and things like that. And I'm like, oh God, like this game is over. So he charges in and um, I'm very lucky that um, uh, he fails the charge, a re-rollable charge as well, I think, with um, uh, that unit of, what do you call them? What do you call them? I've been saying them the whole freaking time and now they're um, gone. Hex rays, fouls it against Thankwall. So that's a small blessing. But apart from that, you know, the Dread Scythes and stuff, they and the um, Hex rays, they get in on my Storm Fiends. Um, he spends his command points. He puts his buffs up, his extra attacks and so forth. But um, after we resolve the combats, uh, he doesn't do quite quite as much damage as he would like. And in fact, against the Storm Fiends, like, well, he killed all those rats, right? The Harridans just like chopped those rats up. Well, not all of them, but majority of them. And, um, but against the Storm Fiends, uh, he does about 14 wounds, maybe a little bit more than 14. So I can put those onto my Doomflag Gauntlets to absorb that damage. And it means that I've really got all of my shooting left. So, um, because this was his, his turn in round one and I'm going to go next. Um, that's where my, my damage comes from the shooting. So, you know, we'll keep these guys alive and see what we can do. And well, on the left hand side, you can see what we can do. So, um, the first thing is that, um, Thankwell just puts the warp fire throwers onto, he just moved up, put the warp fire throwers onto those hex rays and, um, basically deleted them. Rolled actually a little bit under average and uh, two were left, but I was able just to club those to death, I believe. And the um, uh, Storm Fiend, so I lost two, I've still got four here, um, you know, between the hero phase with spells and um, then the shooting 
like we were able to kill all those hex rays that came into me there. Um, the Vermin Lord Deceiver just popped in. I wanted to put pressure on this objective and um, try to stab a few Harridans, but like, you know, negative three Ren doesn't mean anything to them. And uh, all you need to do is make a few saves and the Vermin Lord Deceiver doesn't really do a lot. But um, uh, like he, he cleared my chaff walls. He came in with his big charge and his big hit didn't do as much damage, kind of bounce, and um, then I was able just to turn on the warp fire and start clearing all the ghosties out and pushing back. Um, he won the initiative again, damn it. Like if I had won the initiative now, it would have been awesome. And so he's up on points, right? Because he's captured like all of the objectives except for mine for these two turns, first two turns. And now he knows he's very light on troops, but he's really up on points. So turn three, there's no point him just sitting there in combat with those Harridans. Um, so he retreats those back into onto my home objective and ends up capturing like all five, uh, sorry, all four objectives for this turn, which gives him heaps of points. So at this point, at the end of his turn three, he's like really like I've got like two points or something like that. And he's far ahead of me and I'm looking at the table I'm thinking well it doesn't matter even if I table you here um, I can't claw it back but that's actually not true and um, you always make sure that sometimes when you think you can't win on points it's just because you're actually a dumbass and you haven't done the mass wrong right and you can so that's what the the table looks like before we go into my turn three I completely forgot about these rats and um yeah, let's go for it. So what happens? Well, Thankwell moves up onto this objective. There are a bunch of uh, poxy bloody um, chain rafts that were in range of me. We put the warp fire throwers onto them and we absolutely killed them. The Vermin Lord Deceiver shoots up the middle here onto that objective. Um, and then the rats move up and the storm fiends move up as well. So they uh, shot and killed the Dreadscythe Harridans and then charged into um kill this uh knight of shrouds hopefully and um this will mean that at the end of turn three i'll score three objectives which is pretty cool and then it's just this right one that he's still holding with um with those i had to go from like um i had to go for his home objective as opposed to this one because his home one gives me more points um so that was cool and then uh, i believe at this point I won the initiative so i won the initiative and um we just go ahead and kill basically everything he's got um you know thank one moves up and just burns the banshees off and uh keep these guys here um yeah it's just like from here it's just sort of murderous and um this is what it looks like at the end of the game so took all the objectives so took all the objectives i think for two rounds like turn four and turn five and then on my turn three took three of them so despite not holding any of them except for my home one for the first one or two turns um you know quite quickly it sort of spun out i end up winning by only one victory point um so tight game as far as the victory points goes but um as far as what's on the table well we we managed to kill everything so that was cool so that's the end of doomcast folks that's the um list i'm going to be taking a bush bash it's not gut busters i know but um um it's skaven but i don't think it's a particularly strong flavor of skaven it's a fun flavor of skaven but um uh, we'll see how we go um i've got a round one grudge or a play date against um rice so um he's bringing his chaos dwarves and he's got a super good chaos dwarf army and he normally goes like four and one at tournaments he's a really good player so i don't really expect to come out on top on that one but um maybe that will put me in a good position for a sneaky submarine right um so that's it folks thanks for watching um remember make sure you subscribe so you can be a part of the giveaways go check out mr mephisto's channel and leave a comment you have to leave a comment on his video for my automatic um comment selector tool to work right so go over to the video i'll put in the link below and um, subscribe to him and then leave a comment as well so when i choose the winner on his videos i'll do it by a comment and then i'll be like okay this comment i'll check if you're subscribed to him and then because um, i can check your subscriptions and then um and then you'll be able to win so go to his channel subscribe to him 
leave a comment and um, you'll be in the running for the Fellwater Trogoths. Um, just a reminder again, everything, all the proceeds that uh, this channel generates go to charity. So please like, please leave a comment below, watch the video for as long as you can. All of these things um, help to promote it. So uh, big month coming up ahead. We've got um, Battle Tome reviews for Caesar Sigma as well as Orc War Clans. We've got um, Ossiarch Bone Reapers. We've got battle reports. We've got bloody um, the Bendigo Bush Bash tournament report as well. Like we've got heaps of stuff coming out. So I think the next two months actually are just going to be like massive. But um, that's good. So that's it, folks. That's Doomcast number four. Uh, thanks for watching. Till next time. Ciao, grazie, and arrivederci.